Welcome back. It's a podcast. Oh my god. Oh, you scared fuck. Me. Yeah, wow. I don't know why. I don't know why I opened it that, that way. Nobody does. Nobody's going to like that. Nobody's going to be happy with it, Sophie. What am I doing? I think some Wait, of the fans really do life? like it. Were, I don't know if it's like a Stockholm ha- syndrome they are, thing. They are sickos. They are yeah. sickos. You're did right it bring about that, you Molly. joy, Robert? <laughs> No, nothing does anymore. Well, the only then. thing that brings me joy is the film Twisters, which I'm still going to talk about. I know I talked <laughs> about it at the Tuesday opening, but you know what I really appreciate about Twisters, Molly, and about well, hopefully, Twister? Hopefully some of the fans have had time to see it since they listened yeah, to the first yeah. episode. So now they're you, on board. You got to go watch it out yeah. and see it. You know, you got to go watch it. They're going to stop making tornado movies if we don't watch them. Right. And then what's going to happen to Oklahoma's tourism? You have to support the tornado based economy. <laughs> What I love about these movies is that they all decided, and this is the smart decision from a filmmaking standpoint, the tornadoes had to be sentient. Like these these are tornadoes that have enemies and that have grudges and that are targeting city centers to do as much damage as possible. Wait, there I was a, joking about that. That's real. No, there is a scene where the tornado <laughs> roars at our main characters and then throws a semi truck at them. Because they're fighting. Owns. <laughs> They're fighting like these people are trying uh-huh. to destroy tornadoes. Yes, yes, yes. Like, they're the they going movie, to war against the wasn't tornadoes. Wasn't the goal to just like learn from? Like they were like tornado scientists. They wanted yeah, to like but learn you've from it. Yeah, got to escalate. Yeah, the, the initial movie. Their go- but their goal is they want to learn from it so they can predict them, and so that what's her name doesn't have her dad sucked out into the sky again. Right, but it was he, about like predicting for like evacuation. But this is about like yes. physically fighting it. Yes, because no one. So one of the through lines and twisters is that. No one who lives in Tornado Alley has ever heard of a tornado or knows what to do. None of the houses have shelters. And the only people are our heroes who are a bunch of like weirdo storm chaser YouTube nerds have to like go into towns and warn everyone to evacuate because Oklahomans just don't know about tornadoes. And and nobody believes these out of towners. (laughs) Well, no, it's always very clear because there's a giant tornado the size of an aircraft carrier in the sky. Does Glenn Powell just like hip check the tornado in his regular jeans? And no, that's he, how the he, he over? drives a very cool truck and shoots fireworks into it. So if we, well, actually, someone else drives While the truck. I forgot no the lady's shirt name. And a regular jeans. He's wearing. Well, I'd actually I don't think Wait, we get a his shirt. shirt got scene. sucked into the tornado. He's very wet a lot of the time, though. So he does get Funny. to show off. Yeah. Anyway, I, I guess should we talk about this racist Molly? I, mean, I was having more fun talking about a sentient yeah. tornado, but I knew that couldn't last. It's less fun it than last. Glenn Powell. I don't think Glenn Powell has killed dozens of people. You Probably. don't know that. Uh, you know, I mean, actually, look what we found out about Army Hammer. But here's what I'll say. If if Glenn Powell has been killing people, I'm sure they're an even mix of white, black, every color of the rainbow. Glenn Powell and I'm, murders. I just feel <laughs> confident he didn't use dogs. Definitely not. a not. He would never, never stoop to dogs. For his killing, he might use dogs. He might use dogs. That's not as. And that's chance. the end of the cold opening. We're back. I hope Glenn Powell is not a listener because <laughs> <laughs> we're kind of being needlessly mean to a man that, as far as I'm aware, hasn't ever done anything bad to anyone. If you are sorry. I said you were made <laughs> sorry, with a 3D Glenn. printer. <laughs> there's, there's a uh, yeah. I still um, don't know who he is. Yeah, it's he's very good looking, Molly. But again, in a way that's kind of off putting. Yeah. He, prob- he, he has to know that, right? Um, I'm sure he knows. Louis Van Schur, not very good looking, in my opinion. <laughs> uh, now, as I noted last episode, it's a little bit hard to triangulate the price- precise length of time that Louis was killing people. But the bulk of his murdering seems to have occurred from around 1986 to 1989. These are the twilight years of the apartheid regime, and the anxious business owners and middle-class whites of East London saw Lewis again as a hero. He is their own private Batman, and that is how they look at him. Most of the businesses that contracted with his company had silent alarms. When someone broke in, Van Schur would be alerted and he would rush to the scene. To surprise the intruder, he always showed up alone in a private vehicle, no sirens. And as was his wont, he went barefoot. He later told a reporter, it's quiet. You don't have your shoes squeaking on tiles and stuff. So again, his interest is not to stop robberies or to arrest people. It is to sneak up on them so that he can murder them very, very brutally. Um, he I just claimed don't like to not... the idea that he's not wearing shoes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's just extra creepy, right? It's like a reverse diehard. <laughs> um, 
Now, he claimed to not turn on lights and that he usually avoided flashlights. He's inconsistent on that last point, so I suspect he did use a flashlight to at least try to shock his targets. But to the press, he would claim that his primary sense for hunting was his sense of smell. Quote, sen- uh, wait, sense for what now? Hun- uh, hunting? Hunting, yes. Hun- hunting, That's how okay. he describes this. Great, great. Okay. He's just talking openly about when the press come in, like, seems like you're shooting a lot of people. He's like, yeah, I love hunting people. You know, (laughs) I hunt by sense of smell. If somebody breaks in, the adrenaline gives off an odor and you can pick that up. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. I don't, I don't know that I think you can, but that's a very unsettling (laughs) thing to say. That's something a monster says, Lewis. I mean, I guess, you know, like gamblers, you have a system, you have superstitions, you have these beliefs about your craft. (laughs) Yes. And some people have better senses than others. So I'm not going to say, like, it's definitely true that, like, fear sweat is different, smells different. You can kind of tell s- sometimes if somebody's But you can't like, smell a guy in the back of the CVS. You're not go. I don't think you're going to, but maybe Lewis is the predator, you know? He is a I mean, predator. He spent a long time with dogs, but he did not yeah. develop any dog-like skills. <laughs> the dogs have taught me their t- their skills, yeah. Now, the adrenalines with Van Schuur were mostly conducted at the start of the 90s, before he was charged with any crimes for his many murders. He was a subject of bemusement for a lot of reporters, and their stories helped build him a legend and earn him the love of many mm-hmm. in the local white community. The vast majority of his victims were very poor, the kind of people who often broke into stores to steal food or cash. Uh, And as a result, their deaths made very little impact in the local papers. If they were mentioned, it usually wasn't by name. Robbers shot breaking into pharmacy or whatever. White business owners and middle-class residents knew of Lewis, at least by reputation, and overwhelmingly considered him a hero. Black residents also knew him. Stories spread in Zosha of a bearded man, nicknamed Whiskers, who would stalk men through the streets and make them disappear forever. As journalist Dominic Jones, one of the first to report on Lewis, said, Lewis Van Shore was basically going out and murdering people for sport. Lewis himself would tell the BBC during an investigation decades later, every night is a new adventure, if you want to put it that way. No, I don't. I don't, I don't want to put it that way. That Not way. at all. What do you mean? An adventure. And, like, and this is going on for long enough that he's becoming this sort of like real life boogeyman in these communities. Yeah. Like they know. Of course he, he is. Yeah. And I guess they don't know where he's going to be or which alarms go to his phone. No, and you probably, because of how it's being reported, some people are probably aware it's all this one guy, but like a lot of locals, both whites and blacks, are probably think this is more a, a bunch of people committing murders because of how many people he's shooting. You wouldn't naturally why would assume, you assume why would you all assume of these one are guy? one guy. It's a lot for one guy, right? Um, oh, that's very yeah. upsetting. Now, at the time, things had changed enough in South Africa that Lewis had to claim he never went hunting, quote, with the intention of killing black people. He just found stalking then don't call it hunting. Being, he does call it hunting a lot. <laughs> he says he just found it exciting. And I... I do think parts of this are true, although not in a way that makes it better. Louis Van Schur, to me, feels like a guy who would have taken a job that let him hunt and kill humans in any society where that job existed. He's, again, definitely racist, but I think that the killing was more the motivation than the racism. The racism provides the opportunity and the legal cover to do the killing, right? This is my take on it. Lewis reported every murder to the local police, and when he was criticized for being a serial killer, he would defend himself by saying his actions were, quote, all within the law. This was untrue in a strict textual sense, but it was accurate in that the cops supported what he was doing. As Lewis said, every officer in East London knew what was going on. All the police officers knew. Not once did anybody say, hey, Lewis, you're on the borderline, or you should cool it or whatever. They all knew what was happening. Right, so, so you're that, saying like not people didn't know it was all one guy, but like whoever's processing the, the cops forms know, he's for turning, sure. the he's, cops he's definitely know. Paperwork. Yes, uh, the cops are not are fully aware because they also are showing up at the scene every time he shoots someone, right. which is all the time. He is always shooting people, and there's so never are, a conversation about like, did you do a crime? I don't think there's an interest in having that conversation. And obviously, as Lewis said, I don't think he's lying about this. I think he like he seems to be legitimately frustrated because he does get in trouble eventually where he's like, look, I talked to the cops. None of them said I was like a borderline. Right. Nobody ever said to stop shooting people. Why am I in trouble? Yeah. Like they should have told me sooner. (laughs) They needed to tell me the exact amount of people I needed to shoot. 
Now, obviously, we shouldn't, I, I don't necessarily think he's lying there, but we shouldn't take his word for it. Uh, that said, one of the local journalists. I mean, they didn't put, stop him. They, they didn't stop him. One of the local journalists who put together a team to start looking into Lewis was, and this is another great South African name, Patrick Goodenough. Good Literally enough. just the words good enough good stuck enough. together. What was going on in that country that that became a last name for you people? Huh? I just feel like Where that's kind that of a burden from? to bear. Right? Yeah, good enough. Oh, because you just know every year at journalism school, whenever he turns in an assignment, you know, his teachers are making fun of that name one way or the other. You know, yeah, this is good enough. Ah, uh, not, not good enough. enough. Not good enough. Sorry, Patrick. I'm sure you had a tough road to hoe. You seem to have turned into a fine man because he's going to be one of the heroes of this story. Good enough. Um, good enough. Uh, he said of the police in East London, there's, the support for him was massive. He would not have been able to get away with a fraction of what he got away with without it. Now, another of the journalists who dug into this story back before it was a story was Issa Jacobson, who I quoted last episode. Here's the BBC discussing her very early efforts to uncover what was going on. In the police records held in public archives, Miss Jacobson found instances of killings where the officers had been present at the time of the shootings. At no point did they appear to question Van Schur as a suspect. In many instances, the police failed to take photos of the deceased at the scenes of the shooting and failed to collect key forensic evidence, such as bullet casings. Van Schur was often the only witness to his shootings, so this evidence could have been crucial for determining what had actually happened in each case. These were cover-ups. He had the backing from police officer of police from police officers from junior rank and senior rank, said Mr. Goodenough. They wouldn't invest investigate. They'd sit down with him and have a cigarette while chatting with bodies lying nearby. Mm -mm. Yeah, that's mm -mm. not good. Pretty gross, I think. I mean, I guess the cops are doing some of this, too, because when he was doing it when he yes. was a cop, like just well, the, the, shooting, fair, shooting these, poor these people for sport. Are murdering just, black people, yeah, too. It's just happening. It's yeah. just understood. Yeah. He is probably talking shop with a guy who also just killed someone a lot of the time. Right. Right. Um, so it's not like they are too stupid to realize he's shot all of no, these people no, in no. the back on the I, ground. They know. I, I, don't, I don't know how much all of the local like white business owners are aware of the specifics of what Lewis is doing. But the cops but they are. They don't like care the, they, they don't they don't give a shit. No, no, no. Except for, uh, you know, a, a good number of journalists actually do like there is a it takes a significant journalistic effort. This is actually a case of a murderer who is caught by the press and prosecuted. Um, I mean, I guess once a hundred guys are missing. That is like, funny you say that, Molly, families. because by 1989, Lewis has been involved in at least 100 shootings, oh, come probably on. I a was lot more. Again. No, no, he is <laughs> at least 100 shootings. And Lewis himself will say, like, I have no idea how many people I shot. There were way too many of them to keep track of. So normally I would say, like, I don't know how many people I've killed is is a very bad thing to say. But I think yeah. once you get into a certain number, it's going to be bad regardless. Probably better that he doesn't know because if he's keeping meticulous yeah. records that's worse yeah. that's worse yeah. i i talked to a drone pilot once who was told at like the end of his time of service by his superior the number of people that had been killed in drone strikes he'd participated in oh, and it was in the that. thousands and he was like why did you tell me this has just ruined my life <laughs> like there's no amount of therapy Which, that can undo I mean, that moment you should know, right? It actually, it should be traumatic to blow people up with a drone. It's better that it's traumatic, right? It just um, seems like telling him was a rude thing to do. It is kind of a dick move from your boss, though, right? Hey! <laughs> hey, man, good job. Good job. <laughs> Wanted to let you know. <laughs> You've been responsible for the deaths of thousands. You know, statistically, about a third of them were innocent, at least. Maybe more like 70% based on a lot of our analyses. Anyway... Have a good time as a civilian. Yeah, we had the McKinsey intern figure out how many of them were kids. <laughs> yeah. Oh, a bunch. Yeah. So by 1989, Lewis had been involved in at least 100 shootings. Now, these numbers are not available to anyone, right? They are all buried in a police filing system that doesn't always name Lewis and was designed to frustrate outside observers, like reporters from the East London Daily Dispatch, where Patrick Goodenough worked. Good He'd gotten <laughs> good enough. <laughs> <clears throat> There's people are going to be like, no, it's in South African. We pronounce it Gowdenweef, damn it. How do you how can you not know that? But we're not doing that. You're maybe we we we're absolutely not doing that. that I don't we are care. Disrespecting it on purpose. Is Patrick good enough? And by God, he is. So Patrick got onto the story when he interviewed one of the men who had survived Lewis, uh, a guy named Siabonga Tom, which is another excellent name. Yeah, seriously. Um, 
Now, unfortunately, Siobonga Tom is a child when he is shot. I think he's like 14, something like that. Uh, Patrick had also interviewed Lewis, who had bragged. <laughs> the, the first time the number comes out is that Patrick is just talking to this guy who he, he started to think might be a serial killer. Because Siobonga Tom says, like, I wasn't trying to run. He just kind of tried to execute me, right? So Patrick starts to... And, and Patrick comes across a couple other cases of shootings this guy's involved in, finds out, like, it seems like there's a lot of bodies tied to this guy. So he sits down with Lewis, thinking, like, all right, you know, this is going to be maybe one of the tougher interviews of my life. I've got a man here that I think is a serial murderer. You know, he's probably doing some terrible things and getting away with it, and I'm trying to bring him down. He's going to know that. You know, we're going to be playing this game of cat and mouse, this real, like, Hannibal Lecter moment with a murderer. And as soon as the interview starts, Lewis is like, yeah, I shot more than, like, 100 people in the last couple of years. It's crazy how many guys I'm shooting. <laughs> um, Just very funny. <laughs> oh, the vibes in that room must have been... Yeah insane it's like yeah i reckon i've shot like a hundred people i don't know can't really count that high anyway what's this article about <laughs> now, right he that wasn't even part of the interview he's just yeah. making small talk no he just likes he just likes killing he likes talking about killing he's just a big fan of it you will not be surprised to hear that this convinced patrick he was on to a big story now, he had nearly finished an article on the shooting, but unfortunately, the article was centered because the first survivor he's talked to is Siobonga Tom, right? So his article is centered on Tom's experience because Tom also gives him an eyewitness account of Lewis breaking the law, right? Him execute, you know, just shooting people, right? The problem is that, like all of Lewis's victims, Siobonga Tom gets charged with breaking and entering. And in South Africa, they have this thing where if someone gets charged, the case is now what they called sub-justice, which meant you're not allowed to report on it until the accused gives a statement in court. Oh. I can see why you would have a rule like this. I can understand how, like, even theoretically, it could, it could develop out of good intentions, right? You don't want yellow press tabloid journalism or whatever affecting how a, a court case goes, right? So you want- And a lot of countries have pretty strict laws about how the press yeah. is allowed to report on on crime. Yes. So I, I, I do th understand why, some of why this may have came into place, but in the case, like you really see the weakness of that here because it, every time Patrick gets close to being able to report on Lewis actively shooting people, that person will get charged and he can't publish the article, right? Um, so it's this kind of maddening state of affairs for him. Um, so furious, Patrick decides that the story he has is not good enough, and he con contacts a local legal aid charity called Black Sash to try to get Siabonga a lawyer. He talked with their coordinator, Charlene Craig, about Lewis, who he'd interviewed, uh, and let her know, hey, there's this, like, white former cop security guard who just told me he shot a hundred people? <laughs> you guys are, like, dealing with, you know, legal justice issues in our town. Have you looked into this at all? And it turns out that Charlene had. She hands him a copy of a statement that she had taken a month earlier from a local man named Vizumzi. Quote, <clears throat> in it, and this is from the book, The Color of Violence. In it, he said he was on his way home in October 1988 after trying to get work at a bakery when a man in a backy, it's a kind of vehicle, asked him if he wanted a job. He said he climbed into the vehicle and the two drove a short way to the Turnbull Bowling Club, where the man, who said his name was Van Schur, told him to wait outside the window on the left of the building. According to the statement, Van Schur then disappeared and returned holding a gun. Without warning, he shot Vazumzi twice, in the chest and in his left arm. And it's from this statement that we get our most conclusive answer to the overzealous racist security guard or serial killer question. Because yeah. that is not a story of a random bigot. That is a story of a man who is hunting and entrapping people and using the imperial. Like, that's a serial killer hunting people. Yeah. Right? Like, <clears throat> and like, I'm, you know, maybe racism plays a big role, obviously, him getting away with it. But like, he didn't need to do that. That's, I mean, he didn't need to. He wanted, he wanted no, to shoot you know I mean? this like, man. He entrapped the man by telling him, I have a job for you. And then he shot him. And then he threw his, his like, body like, on a crime scene. But even his like sort of fake justified shootings that he's doing once a week at work. Like, is that not enough? Well, these are, these are what a lot of those shootings are. He, those shootings always get marked down as he was responding to a break-in. What's actually happening a lot of the time 
is he is hunting random black men in the street oh, and he's throwing their bodies into a crime scene, right? Great. Yeah, like Great. he will fake a break in. There will always be something stolen, but it's usually a low value item. Right. So he's also he, just stealing. He is. I'm sure some of this is him responding to B&E's, but most of this is him fucking hunting people and faking it. Oh, that's. It's worse. Yeah, it's much. I, I that's don't, very yeah, sick. It's, it's, they're both bad. But I mean, yeah, both, I think there's, this not is, good, there's not a good. I think this is yeah. the worst huh. version of this story yeah. is the one that happened. I, I'll say that. And you know so what's he really the, is just a regular old serial killer, I, but existing so. within a system that allowed him to behave yes. that way. Yes. And congratulated him for behaving that way. Yes. Yes. I think that is the most accurate way I can I can describe this. I don't feel good, Robert. <laughs> I it's <laughs> neither do I. Uh, but it's time for ads, so that'll be nice. That's a, oh, that will soothe my soul. Yeah, our spirits will be lifted immediately. And we're back. Oh, man. Having a great back, time. Back, back again. So, so this guy, Bazumzi, was, like all the others, charged with breaking and entering. So his case could not be reported on, right? So again, our boy good enough keeps getting these really important stories. And then as he writes it up and is ready to hand it to an editor, gets the notice that, like, oh, this guy's been charged. Can't say shit now. You know, gotta wait. So... <clears throat> The good news is that Shailene and her colleagues are now on the case as well, and as a legal aid charity, they have none of the same restrictions as the press. Uh, they have collected at this point three other identical accounts nearly from men who had been hunted, shot, and survived, right? So this is four cases Shailene brings to him of like, yeah, these guys all said that he literally just grabbed them off the street, right? And that's a strong so, pattern at this point. That's a pattern. That's that's a pretty good pattern, I because would you gotta say. you got to figure a lot of them don't live. So if you have four guys who lived, he's probably yeah. done this a lot. There's a lot of, and also one of the things that starts to come out is there's a lot of families <laughs> asking, like, my son or my husband just disappeared. Where are they? And in a lot of cases, the police are just throwing these dead people into oh, unmarked graves and no. never telling anyone. So again, we have no idea how many people he actually killed. Oh, you know, some no. of these people do find out like that their son was thrown into an unmarked grave, but the cops are working to cover up a serial killer's murders. Can I ask a, 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 a stupid question that's also morally sure. abhorrent? Yeah. Um, why do so many of them live? Well, it's because it's a handgun. So this is a, so there's the gun stuff. A lot of people don't know. Handguns are handguns and rifles are rifles, right? A handgun is a terrible weapon to kill someone with. It's just the most convenient, right? It's easy to have one on you. They are not very powerful. It is extremely common for people to be shot. I have read of cases. There's a, a one particular case of a couple of bank robbers that the FBI ambushed. And the FBI shot one man 50 times and the other like 47 times. And both That's men not, li not just lived, but were walked off the scene. Like... It is, it's wild how many bullets people can take if they're handgun bullets and survive. Rifles are a bit of a different case. You know, not that people don't survive shots from rifles, but it is a very different kind of injury you're looking at. I feel like if I had Whereas, 40 paper cuts, I might not, I might ask to be put on a stretcher, but 40 bullet holes. <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot. I mean, you also have to note that like the nine millimeter of the day is a weaker round than the same bullet now because there have been advances in ballistics and like just how we make bullets. Right. Um, I just feel like if he's that interested in killing, like, I don't know. Is, don't it, is it just the? Is I it think the, these guys are the grievously activity. injured. The, I no, mean, I just mean like, is it is it the activity that he is interested in, and it doesn't really yeah, matter to be. him how it ends. I think he's trying to kill them, but I also think he's probably not like checking for a pulse. A lot of times, it's hard. To, it's not actually if you ever tried to take the pulse of an injury. It's like not always easy. Right. He's not smart. I don't credit him with being a great planner. I think he he's just, just shooting really guys. Care. They lose consciousness because they've been shot repeatedly, and some of them wake up, some of them don't. You know, that's kind of the deal. So okay. one of the Heidi, the the person who wrote that book, makes a big deal about the fact that he used hollow points and how this is like evidence of his murderous intent. I actually disagree with that. Hollow points are just kind of like it's what everyone who carries a handgun in a city is going like anywhere is going to use because they 
they are better at stopping people, but they also penetrate less. So if you are someone like a cop or a security guard and you think you might be shooting at someone in an urban environment, you want a bullet that is less likely to go through them and then hit someone else, right? Like it's just whatever. Or damage the does, merchandise. But, yeah. Or damage the merchandise. But anyway, whatever. It doesn't really matter. So <clears throat> Shailene and her colleagues collect like four accounts of guys who have been hunted and shot and survived. And they reach out to a legal aid lawyer, Dave Pittman, who suggests getting victim statements so that they can file for criminal charges. And I'm going to quote next from Heidi Holland's The Color of Murder. Uh, And this is her talking to Pittman. I drove to East London where I was joined by Charlene Craig, recalls Pittman, accompanied by a a relative of Sia Bongo. We went directly to Frere Hospital where we found the victim with a bullet wound running from his abdomen clear through his back. A telling piece of evidence collected from the custody of the hospital was the clothing he had been wearing when he was shot, notably a synthetic fiber tracksuit. The tracksuit top had a gaping hole in front, with indications that the fiber had been burned in the vicinity of the hole, which would prove Siabonga's allegation that he had been shot at point-blank range. Armed with Siabonga's statement and his clothes in a plastic bag, we drove jauntily to the Fleet Street Police Station. I don't know why we needed <laughs> to know how jauntily that you drove. We were just having a good time. But Heidi, Heidi knows these kinds of details are important to really make a story come alive. I feel like I'm there. <laughs> yeah. Now, no sooner had they taken a statement from Siabonga than there was another shooting in East London. Police noted a security guard had been involved, but refused to name him. Obviously, at this point, everyone involved in this case, the journalists in Black Sash, are like, well, it was, must have been Lewis, right? <laughs> Probably was the guy who we shoots all someone know it's every the shooting day. Guy. <laughs> it's the guy who only shoots people. It's the human hunter. Yeah. yeah. Now, the victim in this shooting was Muntuzima Titi, 24, a night watchman, so a security guard himself who had been walking home from a late shift when a white stranger ran up to him in the night, shot him, and tossed him in the back of his car. When he woke up in the hospital, police charged him with breaking and entering. (laughs) That sucks. Such a nightmare. That fucking sucks. (laughs) Just a horrible, horrible situation. Also, how how much blood is getting in his car? You're literally a security guard. (laughs) How much blood is in this man's car if he's routinely putting shot like shooting victims I think in he's his got car? Like, I think he's got like a flatbed and he's just kind of throwing them in there and then hosing, hosing it, it off. Out. That's Jesus. the way I'd do it, you know? That's the way I've done it. I mean, would would haven't uh killed anyone in my truck. Um Molly, what do you drive? I'm not giving out that kind of personal information. <laughs> <laughs> to your hordes of deranged fans. Yeah, you're Robert, right, you're right. what? One of them could be like this guy, yeah. You were just yeah. complaining about people texting you instead of messaging on <laughs> Signal, and you're like, hey, Molly, what kind of car do you <laughs> what drive? What kind of car do you drive? Who do you drive? No, I just want to know. I just want to Is it a my good last one? Car, my last car got totaled while I was covering, um, it was a post-J6, like, you know, free the insurrection boys rally. My car got totaled um, while uh. it was parked you know, there was a police chase in D.C. and the, Oh, man. And they totaled my parked car. Anyway, but before that, so now I have a car that has no giant key scrapes on it, Robert. And that is very precious to me because my last car got keyed up by some sort of neo-Confederate weirdo oh, who pissed on my great-grandfather's grave. Oh. So, no, I'm not telling you what I drive. Very specific. <laughs> it's well, very specific. I have a car with no blood stains in the bed, you know? Congrats. Yeah, I don't think there's I don't think there's any blood in my car. So actually there's kind of a lot of blood in the back of my anyway, whatever. Ro- it's roadkill. It's fine. So by this Why point, did you put it in the car? Because it's a truck. What where, where else do you put your roadkill? Is this because you read I'm too much about put RFK? It in the cab. You read too no, much I, about RFK have, and now I you're am, interested. I now like you're interested. Good, I like fresh roadkill, Molly. I would not feed it to a hawk. I feed it to people. <laughs> All right. Can we move on? Anyway, you're being, Patrick, you're being a little weird now, Robert. Okay. Patrick, so there's good a, enough by what? So there's a lot of blood in the car. Okay, moving there's on. A lot moving of, on. Probably a lot of blood in his car. But, but there's a lot point, of normal reasons why there might be. Yeah, sure, of course. Well, no, he's he's just abducting security guards and yeah, throwing them in the bed just, of his truck. He's just a serial yeah. killer. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's, he's just a serial killer. By this point, Patrick Goodenough had tied Lewis to five fatal shoe, shootings, which was good, but not good enough. Uh, He had also found seven wounded victims. In June of 1989, Pittman had enough to file attempted murder and civil damages against Lewis. This gave Pittman public victim damage statements to use, uh, or sorry, this gave good enough uh, public victim damage statements that he could use in his reporting, right? At this point, the victims have put out a public damage statement so he can, like, 
theoretically write an article. So they're filing a civil suit. So they're not. Yeah, there's filing criminal charges and a civil suit. They're defense. You can do, you can do both of the guy shoots. Wait a second. So do they? Their defense attorney brought. No, 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 no. Pittman. He, this guy is not a defense attorney. Uh, oh no. Oh, wait, no, sir. Yeah, he's just an attorney. Uh, but he's like, you know, his attitude is, we should charge this guy with murder and okay. like as with everything we can. We need to get him off the street, right? That's what Pittman is trying to do, right? He wants to right. stop the guy, this guy, from being able to shoot people. I didn't realize we we'll got the prosecutor to agree later. to this. Well, he he's files the charges, right? Um, I guess and, they just have a different system because you can't do that here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know the South African apartheid era. I don't know how that worked, right? I'm just I'm just reading what the reporting on it said. Right, right, right. Um, but Pittman has these public victim damage statements, which now theoretically Patrick Goodenough can report on. But when he gets an article together, his editor, they have an editorial meeting that Goodenough isn't allowed in, but it's like very frantic. He can see people arguing and yelling. And then his editor says, no, you can't publish anything. So Patrick puts together a stripped down version of the article, one in which he does not name any names, but just notes that charges have been brought against a security guard who was shooting a lot of local people. This too is refused from publication. During a mm. phone call with Lewis, the killer boasted to the journalist, I'm in full production, full production. Basically, I'm still working. <laughs> Nothing about this has hurt me yet. Um, okay. And so as... All of this kind of like start keeps winding its way through the courts. There's very little interest in the story when a week later, Van Schur attends an inquest for a shooting the year before in June of 1988. Okay, now, so we're getting an inquest. Yes, he, he is occasionally involved in inquests. And in, in this particular shooting, he had arrived on scene to the site of a wimpy bar, which is a chain of restaurants, I think. Uh, and this one is by the beach. And a 13-year-old and a 15-year-old have broken into it searching for cash. Lewis had arrived and both kids had fled terrified from the bearded demon now hunting them. Lewis caught the boys hiding in a bathroom, unable to run away. He opened fire, hitting one, uh, hitting the two kids seven times and killing one of them. I think he killed the 13-year-old. This is what really lights a fire under Patrick's ass because he's like, this guy's murdered children. Um, and he confirms, he starts like doing police. He like goes physically on site and combs through records of every police shooting for the last couple of years. And he's able to confirm that Lewis has been on the site of more than 270 silent alarm calls in recent years. That's, uh, he, that's a lot. He enlists other colleagues and they start trolling through uh, inquest records. And one by one, they found more. They find more Louis Van Schur killings. Zola Sotifia, 27, had been killed on November 15th, 1987. Sidwell Bomba Kubaka, 37, gut shot in June of 1987. Kukile Nexo, shot in the head and stomach. By the time he was done on his first day, Patrick had confirmed 22 murders committed by Louis Van Schur. The cases all had chilling similarities. At each break-in, a single low-value item had been removed. Van Schur was never questioned at court, just asked to submit statements that he had crafted to comply with the letter of the law. He always asserted he'd shouted a warning and claimed that he had fired in the direction of the suspects rather than at them. This was thin stuff to defend a man who had shot so many people, but South African judges had the right to close an inquest if they concluded there were no live witnesses who could provide added context and since lewis well, was usually a great way to get <laughs> out of a real murder. hole yeah so <laughs> to make sure there's no one else i mean murder can never really be prosecuted as long as you kill yeah. everybody who's there mm -hmm. well we got all the context the guy who did the murder told us everything so there's really nothing else to gain by a trial you know or by a court case um cool good system as it became clear, one of the modern era's most prolific serial killers lived in their town, the Black Sash and Good Enough's reporters were inundated suddenly with information. Heidi Holland writes, A massive dossier began to grow against the man whose callous exploits read like a scene from a Dirty Harry script. She really likes comparing this to Dirty Harry. I don't think it's very similar. I don't he think you could do it more than once or twice. No, because also <laughs> Dirty Harry specifically doesn't shoot people running away Oh, well, I guess he probably does. I, I, I need to rewatch that movie to say that. I've never See, seen the I, movie. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, oh, I, 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 it's been a long time. Maybe he does shoot some people in the back. I wouldn't be surprised if he did. Anyway, I'm going to continue that quote. He ran across roofs, entered dark buildings alone and unafraid with his gun clasped in both hands, arrogantly admitting in court documents that he fired seven, eight, or even ten shots at a time. To everyone's surprise, Van Shore himself contributed to the dragnet that was closing in around him after he heard on the radio that investigators believed he had killed at least 34 people. At around midnight one night, three days after shooting his latest and last victim, dead, Lewis telephoned Dominique Jones, one of the reporters, to set the record straight. Number 39, pal, was all he said. No. <laughs> Again, he's not a bright man. Um, That's something that happens on, like, I don't know, like, season 17 of a yeah, police procedural. Yeah, but he just called Jerry and be like, shot another guy today. Number 39. <laughs> Feeling fine. Yeah. Heidi describes Lewis in this per last period of impunity as the human avatar of the apartheid government, exuding a calm, mm -hmm. macho air of competence and utterly certain violence meant to calm the white populace and frighten black South Africans away from white society. He's a human wall. In the last months of his long killing spree, Lewis shot a person almost every week, and he killed one person almost every three weeks. But then in November of 1989, the fever pitch of media attention and protests prompted the local attorney general to order an inquiry. This was one of the most significant criminal prosecutions of the late apartheid era, a sign that the consensus around this evil system had frayed irreparably. In 1990, Nelson Mandela was released from prison. Lewis and his security firm recognized that the wind had shifted, and so did the local cops. In 1991, Lewis was finally arrested and charged. The final credible tally of his kills was 39 dead and dozens more injured. We, we will never have any clear idea of how many people this guy shot. Um, but he kills at least 39, which puts him up there. That is top 1% of serial killers, right? That is a lot. Um... And at you know, a kind of an incredible pace. Uh, yeah, like, especially for three, like, if you hear, if you hear a serial killer kills like 20 people in 30 years, you're like, wow, that's one of the, one of the big ones, you know? But Lewis he's is- He's just cranking them out. He's, yeah, he is. He's really a, he's a workman-like serial killer, you know? He's just putting in the hours, Molly. It's all about putting in the hours. Anyway, here's ads. Oh, Sabrina, his daughter, was just 12 years old. And I'm not a serial killer, Molly. It's alarming I that this man has children. Wanted to I just wanted to make I that clear. I, I forgot I about Sabrina. Uh -huh. Yeah, I don't, I, it's alarming he has a daughter. I do not like that part. Oh, you're, not, you're really not going to like where her story goes. Okay. But it, although, throughout all of this, he has like little contact with her, right? Sabrina's been with her mom. He has very little contact with her. Uh, yes. That's uh, for the best. You would think so. Um, oh, no. So she's 12 years old in August of 1991 when she learns via radio broadcast that her father was accused of being one of the most prolific murderers in the country. She described herself as feeling almost dead because, quote, I worshipped my father. I was very, very upset. Well, yeah, I mean, obviously. Sure. Lewis had not been super present, um, but also her brother and her, her mother and her brothers all see, they seemed like they were assholes. Like, I think her whole family kind of sucked ass. Sabrina's really the only one who maybe doesn't. Yeah, but, but her mom um, didn't kill like 80 guys. No, she she sure didn't. But she kind of likes him more because her mom is the one that's around all the time. And Lewis shows up occasionally for like special visits, right? Sometimes right, like when you're 12, like your mom right. who grounds you is, is a bitch who sucks. And like your yeah. dad who shows up and takes you to the movies is cool. I got it. She, she, she doesn't want uh Sabrina to see her dad at all and sometimes he he'll, he'll set up like secret visits like when she Sabrina's staying with a friend he'll come over to sit to hang out with her that's a which real is red flag really, that's we really weird red creepy, flag actually. behavior yeah <laughs> Now, Sabrina had, against her, again, against her mother's wishes, started reconnecting with her dad in, like, the months or the years or so before he got arrested. She'd even started dressing like him and going barefoot to mimic his fashion sense. Mm -hmm. Her mother seems mostly to have wanted to try to keep her away from the topic, but the case quickly made her dad famous. She remembers the night that they found out about this, a cop friend of the family drops by and tells her her dad is a superhero. Um, oh, so again, we, we are talking white people in apartheid South Africa. These are not <sighs> a lot of thin on the ground. Nice like, folks. I don't mean to right? be melodramatic, but I felt bile rise in my chest oh, yeah. when you said that. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's yucky. The, the, 
There is a massive level of popular support for Lewis during his trial from the white populace of East cool. London. Uh, the BBC reports, quote, one entrepreneurial businessman printed bumper stickers with pictures of the security guard. They said, I love Lewis next to a heart full of bullet holes. <laughs> Half of that sentence was so much worse. There's like, sometimes there's society. I'm, I'm going to get in trouble. Um, since the trial occurred in the dying days of the apartheid regime, the justice system still favored a man like Lewis. He was ultimately charged with 39 murders, but only convicted of seven. The other 32 Good killings enough. were listed as justifiable homicides. Yeah, he should have been killed. Seven should be enough, though, to put you away forever, right? Like seven it murders? Is. Uh, it is, right? Yeah. No. That should be a long sentence. We're not going to get one. Lewis oh. was convicted. He was sentenced to something like 90 years, but he was allowed to serve them all concurrently, which means he was guaranteed pretty much guaranteed less than 20 years behind bars with good behavior. And he is a great prisoner. All the guards loved him, loved him. Super oh, popular with the white prison guards. <laughs> Relatives of his victims were furious and the case made it clear how much work the police had put into keeping Lewis free. The dead that good enough were able to uncover was just a fraction of the total, which we will never know. Many black families in East London never recovered the bodies of their family members. Marlene Mvumbi's brother Edward was killed by Van Schuur in 1987. His body was thrown into an unmarked grave and the family was left unnotified. For Sabrina, her father's disgrace was a constant confusing through line in her adolescence. In high school, she read an article about her dad and realized how little she understood him. She decided to write or she had a, a, a school project to do an art to like write about an evil man and like oh, what no. made them evil. And she's like, well, I'll write an article about my dad. And she gets a bunch of news clippings from the librarian about her father. But she decides not to write the piece because as she starts writing it, she can't not write defensively about her father. Um, and she notes, most of my friends were blacks and coloreds by then, and I thought it would look like I was praising him. So she writes about Hitler instead. Oh, good. <laughs> I was going to write about my dad, less complicated. I went with Hitler. Yeah, it's a lot easier to just write about Hitler. Jesus Christ, uh, you're doing great, sweetie. You're, do, you're doing like, great, honey. At some point, the, you know, this eighth grade English teacher should have said, you know what? You I'm going to give you an A and I'm, I'm going to send you to the guidance we're, counselor. We're just going to give you an A here. You don't have to write an article about your you dad. Don't have, you don't have to do that. You don't I'm have to do that. I'm very sorry that fact, happened please to you. Don't. <laughs> you know who never writes articles about their fathers? Hmm. <laughs> Sponsors just, of this podcast. Yeah. You Why don't would need they? to do another ad Oh, wait, break. did we You've already do two ads? Jesus, sometimes I'm just in the zone, Sophie. I just can't stop You just stop love plugging. products and just, services so much. I just can't stop plugging. Just a you know? shell for capitalism. I, Ooh, I, you just I, love I, Chumba I love Casino it. so much. Uh, sometimes when I go to bed, every time when I go to bed, the only thing with me is Chumba Casino. You know, <laughs> wow. it's 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 my lover, my friend, my comfort. Um, when I, I heard Toyotas have amazing resale value. Uh, wait, is that is Toyota doing ads? Because if that's the case, I, 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 what, what, what are we doing here, Sophie? Get me on the horn with the Toyota guys. I wanna, I wanna tell them to bring the Hilux to the U.S. You know, do we, do we have juice with Toyota now? Do we have suction? Robert, like I they suggest, say on the wire? I suggest you to the ad people for Toyota. That's never gonna happen. So <laughs> they're on your <laughs> show. They're on your show. <laughs> well, that's great. Every Finally, month, I'm like, I think Holly industry. Fry reads them. I'm we're, like, we're Robert some of those... would love to do an ad for Toyota or mm -hmm. T-Mobile, and they're like, they great, good to problem, know. The, the, the problem is the Toyota people don't want the kinds of ads that I would do, which is the sure. kinds of ads that'll sell Toyotas, right? Because there's no, they're there's cowards. They're just cowards. No car that has been used as successfully in as many insurgent conflicts and outright conventional wars in the world as the Toyota Hilux, you know? Toyota reliability Robert, is what you want to put underneath. We didn't what? need an ad plug. Get back to the script. I'm surprised they didn't have a Hilux in Twisters. Oh. They, they, I, mean, I mean, if you're going to shoot a tornado. They paid by Dodge. <laughs> That's like, a, don't you need a Hilux? Don't you need to make a technical to fight a tornado? No, here's what's why I think it's realistic that they were all Rams and Twister, because the, the Dodge Ram is the official truck of people with 17 DUIs. And every <laughs> character in Twisters has numerous DUIs. Like it is, these guys are Oklahoma storm chasers. Not a one of them has ever gotten behind the wheel sober. And that is and why appropriate would you? for a Dodge Ram. Yeah. Wow. It's not safe to di drive a Dodge Ram sober, you know? You'll flip it. So 
Back to the story. <laughs> yeah. Of course, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sabrina insists that her mother and most of the rest of her close family were very racist, and I don't think she has to go to extreme measures to convince me of this. That sounds she true to me. to have turned out differently uh, because some of her earliest memories were of the maid that her wealthy mother hired to raise her. The maid was a black woman, and Sabrina often called her mom. And she's like, well, I grew up with this black lady basically raising me because my mom was busy all the time. And... I just became very aware of how racist everyone in my family was. Um, as a teenager, she becomes pregnant, and it is with a child that is going to be mixed race, which is a real big deal in South Africa at the time. Especially uh, she, if your dad is the, the racism murderer. Well, and here's the thing. Her mom is furious. She claims that her dad, who is by, behind bars at this point, like calls her mom and is like, be nicer to her about this. So she says her dad actually was always very supportive of her having a mixed race baby. Okay, I am um, once again, I once again misjudged the serial yeah, killer's parenting. He's not bad about this. Her mom is apparently though. Um, <laughs> what the fuck, Robert? She claims that a black friend of hers was the only person who listened to her and didn't judge her and like helped her decide, you know, to keep the kid, uh, which she does. Now, over time, her mother's racism began to grate more and more on her, although it may have just been how controlling Beverly was. Sabrina was kind of the black sheep of the family. Her mother's this rich workaholic. Her half-brothers take over a security firm that her mother started, and they get They shouldn't rich. be allowed to work in that business. <laughs> None of this family should be I doing just, security. <laughs> I know they're not guilty of this. They're not involved. I just, we just they shouldn't do, allow it. She claims they brag about being affiliated with Lewis before he gets convicted. So I think and they that's do marketing. suck ass. Yeah. Now, <laughs> Sabrina, you know, again, kind of the black sheep and claims she was basically a prisoner in her mother's home. Eventually, she reached out to the father of her child who introduced her to a man named Gino who promised that he had a solution to her issues. Murder. Is it a gun? <laughs> no, it's a much more brutal murder than that. Now, there are two versions of this story. Maybe both have some truth. One is that Sabrina wanted to stage a murder that looked random, like a robbery gone wrong, so she could take her inheritance and be free. The other is that she was just so disgusted by her mom's racism that she felt her mother had to die. I don't find that last one entirely credible. It's I've run very into poetic. Interviews. It's poetic. I've but run I don't think interviews. that's right. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, she I mean, I'm that, sure that's maybe something that she tells herself as part of this justification, yeah. part of this working up to it. But it's mostly because, like, your mom's being kind of a bitch. Your mom's kind of a bitch and you want her money, right? Prob you probably. Probably. Yeah. And it's weird. I also think maybe she's not super well because the, there's interviews where she claims, like, on the last day of her mom's life, she wanted to give her a nice goodbye and tell her she loved her and thank she's her for raising her. She's not putting the dog before. down. <laughs> You're Take having, her to get some chicken nuggets. Man, you're having a man slash her throat. Like, <laughs> what, is, what is going on Take here? Take her to her favorite park one last yeah. time. <laughs> you want to go on a walk, mom? <laughs> Don't mind the guy looming in the corner. <laughs> um, Yeah, it's a... Uh, Anyway, it, she she also claimed that like Gino threatened to like kill her and her brother if they didn't do the killing after a while. And anyway, I I don't know a lot of shady stuff here. Gino I don't know how much money. I believe of these claims. But Sabrina did have her mother murdered. Uh, she hired a man to slit her throat and then came upon the body and called the authorities. The whole thing was found out almost immediately. Sabrina was sent to trial where she was not consistent, claiming at times that her mother had loved her mixed race granddaughter and apologizing for what had happened. Still, she also became something of a rallying point for many of the black East Londoners who'd spent years terrified of her father from the BBC. At her trial in June 2002, Sabrina's admirers, the same South Africans who had lived in fear of her father, crowded into the public gallery to commend her for striking a blow against racism by murdering her mother. Mm. Her lawyer, a black man, compared Sabrina's need to free herself from her mother's oppression to the plight of South Africa's freedom fighters under apartheid. Which, I don't, I don't even really know what to say about that. There's a lot of going on, just like a lot of psychology going on here. There's a lot going on here. You're really feeling that rubber band effect of trauma from the apartheid years in this case. Yeah. Has she had the baby or is she just like very yeah, pregnant? She, she has. Uh, I think she's had the kid by this point because she's separate. She misses out on the kid's childhood, you know. Um, but maybe, I don't know. It's, yeah, I, can, it's I just can't up. imagine a more like... It, 
it, it's so visible weird. symbol, right? That like this this man who is using apartheid to murder. She has this mixed race child, mm-hmm. and then he reads like a chill grandpa. Yeah, he is kind of a chill grandpa. Well, not quite. Oh. Um, eh, serial killer grandpa. Yeah. Serial killer grandpa. It's just so, a lot a lot going on for poor Sabrina. Lo- I just lo- I don't know that I falter for it. No, no, I don't. I I, I can't really blame her too much. Lewis, and they didn't they didn't have like forensic files back then so she didn't know that murder for hire never it never works, works out. it never Not, works as much as we love hitmen in movies no one has ever successfully gotten paid for a murder it just doesn't happen the only people involved in that industry are fbi agents and the mentally unsound um that's that's just it that's the whole business um now lewis publicly because there's a lot of articles interview him when his daughter goes to trial it's a it's a huge famous trial and lewis is very publicly accepting of his granddaughter and sabrina i think for self-serving reasons for one thing he's about to go up for parole right and so he wants wants to make it clear i'm not a racist you know yeah, i that shot like a lie black to guys me. but i'm not this, a racist <laughs> that sounds like a you lie know. to me yeah he also he 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 kept being like I if you let me out early I'll be able to raise my granddaughter while well, my daughter's you shouldn't up, be you allowed know? near the child no. <laughs> you shouldn't you, be raising a kid what are you talking about a judge should write up something special that says you can't no, do that you are not allowed to be anywhere close to children in fact when he was brought into court as a character witness to try to help mitigate his daughter's guilt he that's just probably not spent, gonna help. he spent all of the time <laughs> defending himself and arguing for his parole. <laughs> Okay, look, okay, I'm not a lawyer. This isn't legal advice. But if you ever need a character witness for a criminal proceeding, yeah. don't invite a serial killer. I would say, here's my legal advice, free legal advice for all you listeners out there. If you need a character witness for a court case, pick a guy who shot less than 100 people. <laughs> you know, I'm not going mean, to never pick a guy who shot anyone, but certainly not 100 people. That's the number, you know? <laughs> I mean, I guess he does have sort of a unique lived experience when it comes to being a bad person. So he does I, have some perspective yeah. on that. I, I will say as a journalist, if I were just looking for like critiques on shooting a guy in the dark, I would certainly call Lewis. Right. He's, he seems to have been an expert at <laughs> shooting people in the dark in the back. Um, probably would be great uh, at, at that job. I don't know. I don't think that's a job. Anyway. Uh, it, it, him being a character witness does not work. Uh, Mm-mm. she goes That's to prison. Shocking. She's she's gonna be there for like thirteen years. Lewis does so almost years as long as him. Bars. Yeah, a little longer. Oh, longer. L- Lewis oh, only that, does twelve. That, that math really adds up. Yeah. That's really Lewis does twelve. Nice. And when he gets out, he he'd been telling reporters as he was trying to get early release, "I've got to raise my granddaughter. I want to be there for her." He immediately mm-hmm. moves to a different city, and he doesn't even tell his daughter. Does not Thank adopt God. the granddaughter. <laughs> Thank God. Does none of it. Gets married right away. That's fine. <laughs> Just, That's gets fine. what? Gets married again. To uh, a human woman? Yeah, some some lady. Uh, and then I, he gets a job <sighs> on a farm. Funded by a state project to provide poor black people with land and support for operating agricultural businesses. I have to go. (laughs) (laughs) South Africa, baby. Apartheid's gone, but we're still fucked as hell. (laughs) Oh, so apartheid ended while he was in jail. Yeah, 94. uh, Right. I just lost track of I lost track of our years. So he comes out into a different world. Very different world, but he gets he gets it's right to work scamming different. the government. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, cool. So I will say I found an article. Some of the people who worked on that farm said he was a really good member of the team. He was very good at teaching people. He was good at scaring off thieves. But yeah, the, person, <laughs> the person who makes all of these claims in this article, because he gets he gets remo- he gets forced out when there's news stories that are like, it's kind of fucked up. This guy's getting money meant for poor black people. To like encourage them to farm after you know he murdered all those folks. Yeah. The person who makes these claims that like actually he was great and it's really bad that he had to leave is Patricia Nugumbelanga, who owned most of the farm and intersperses her claims about how good Lewis was with anger at the fact that the government has not sent any more subsidies. And Nugumbelanga also faces criminal charges herself from a local security guard who accused her of beating him badly after he broke into a building on the farm. So I don't know how to parse this. I don't know if Lewis was a good worker or not, or if there's something weird about this lady, but the fact that he is on this farm causes an outroar when it gets published, right? And he is forced from the property. 
From the rest of his for the rest of his life, Lewis would be visited on occasion by reporters. He claimed at the end of his days to be quote happy and content, and that ninety percent of the people who recognized him on the street supported what he'd done. But he also expressed disgust at the disgust at the new South Africa. Everything has changed. Mm. People's attitudes, the service in shops, it's not the same. Yeah, I bet. Uh, but yeah. The only good news I can give you is that by July of 2024, Father Time caught up with the old bastard and did to him what the justice system wouldn't. A BBC reporter who visited him before his death noted that he had lost all his teeth and had both his legs amputated after a heart attack. In true Lewis fashion, he accepted only the most brutal form of surgery. Per the BBC, when the surgeon carried out this procedure, Fanshawe requested an epidural instead of a general anesthetic so he could watch them remove his legs. He's such a I was sicko. <laughs> He's such a fucking sicko. <laughs> oh, you know what, Shine on you crazy diamond. It's good I to know them who you option. are, right? That's not an option. I yeah, I even. guess. I guess it's an option. Yeah, because I don't it's very think funny because he he immediately can survive. That, Hearing your femur sawed through. It's yeah. the BBC article super funny because it, it quotes him saying, I was curious. I saw them cutting. They sawed through the bone. In speaking to the BBC World Service, Van Shore wanted to persuade us that he is not the monster that people say I am. No, that's that doesn't help. No. <laughs> that's no. not gonna do it, no. man. <laughs> you didn't have to tell anyone that part of the story. Why didn't the doctor say no? Oh, man. Uh, anyway, Lewis dies July 25th, 2024. He just died due to complications oh, from sepsis in his life. That's like a week yes. ago. Yeah, my yeah. God. Very, very recently. You saw an obituary and you said, mm -hmm. that's my Hell guy. yeah. <laughs> Who is this motherfucker? <laughs> uh, one relative of a victim told the BBC he got off easy, which I agree with. Sabrina, on the other hand, served out her time. She was noted by black inmates who served alongside her as being different from most of the other incarcerated whites. So it does at least seem like the not being a racist stuff was legitimate. Uh, although she was sentenced to 25 years for the murder of her mom, like her dad, she was released after 12 years or so of good behavior. And I wish her the best. Uh, good luck, Sabrina. And what happened to her child? I don't know. Oh, wow. I, I'm going to guess, honestly, with this family, no good news is good news, right? Yeah, just send them just... <laughs> Foster care at this point, that's never a good option. It's never better than a family placement. But I think maybe in this case. Yeah, roll the I dice. think roll when, the your dice. Dad's, when your dad's. Yeah, uh, the murder guy. Yeah. Anyway. Well, Robert, I didn't I didn't like that. That was like that, huh? bad. I mean, I thought the I thought it was going to be pretty bad when you told us that people were um, setting dogs heads on fire. Um, yeah, but I, yeah. Actually, I actually long for more of that now. Every time, it, it, when you're doing a an apartheid South Africa story, it's basically always going to be the bleakest shit you've ever heard in your life. Um, so that's yeah. good. Well, thanks. no good South Africans. Molly, you got any pluggables to plug? Oh my gosh, what do I have to plug? Oh, they're letting me make a podcast now, Robert. Oh, good. Really? Who? Wait, who's doing that? I don't. Somebody very foolish. Uh, no, um, weird little guys. By the time this comes out, will be out. Um, I don't, one, maybe two episodes. You'll be able to go and listen to them. You're gonna love them. It's um, it's uh, it's very uplifting, kind of like this show. Um, just a lot of guys just doing normal stuff that's not upsetting. Yay! Uh, <laughs> it's me. Great. Hi, I'm them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the problem. It's me. More, more horrible <laughs> stories for your ear holes. No, I, I really do think people are going to like it. I hope. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> I do too, Molly. I really do. It's very, it's amazing. And um, it's just, it's like a little creepy crawly night, night, bedtime horror story. And you're and and it's amazing. Yeah. Some people have asked like, oh, is it like behind the bastards where there's like a, a guest? Um, and I think we ultimately decided that um, sort of a spooky bedtime story vibe was a little bit better. So it's just me telling you a story about something terrible. Yeah. But like yeah. in a fun way. In a fun way. And I yeah. assume you will probably also tell them less about the film Twisters. 
my God. I, you know, I think by the time I record the second episode, I will have seen Twister. So maybe I can work that in somehow. Yeah, if, if you really want to be prepped for the podcasting game like I am, Molly, you got to watch Twisters and then you need to go back and watch the O.J. Simpson show where what Ross from Friends plays oh Robert my Kardashian. God, he let calls it him Juice go. all the time. Oh, it's so funny. Oh, Ross I'm, from Friends. Always I'm really busy a, watching always Deep Always a good time. Oh, that's a great Beep show too. Beep is great. Beep is great. No um, Ross from Friends though, but that's probably for the best. No, no Ross from Friends. I I wish I had my own Gary from Beep in my life. You know, I was going to say in the form of a dog who could talk. I almost said Ross from Friends doesn't have like Armando Iannucci vibes, but actually he could have been in the Death of Stalin. Like you All could right. have cast you could have cast Ross from Friends as some like fading elderly Soviet bureaucrat. Um, yeah, he could he could do it. He could do it. I He's got the I range. Li- I think I would like to leave now. Okay. Podcast is over. Hey, well. I love you all. Bye. 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 Bye.